He was born July 23rd in 1910 in Haywood County. He was one of 11 children. He was the middle child, but he outlived all of his siblings. He lived 20 years with cancer in five different areas of his body. Cancer did not take his life, but the complications from his treatments did. He was born July 23rd in 1910 in Haywood County. He was one of 11 children. He was the middle child, but he outlived all of his siblings. He lived 20 years with cancer in five different areas of his body. Cancer did not take his life, but the complications from his treatments did. The doctors told me on two different occasions of surgery that he would not make it. But as I waited and prayed, I never gave up hope. As three doctors stepped off the elevator saying, he made it, he's in recovery. I said, that wasn't your decision. That was the Lord, he made that choice. My dad had so much love for everybody. He was the glue that held our family together. He taught me so much, like how to hold my head high, even when I was the tallest kid in all my classes until I reached high school. And that's hard to do. Uh, but I tried, and uh, he taught me always to do the very best I could do, no matter what kind of job I had. And he never feel sorry for yourself, because you can always look around and see someone else who is in worse shape than you are. And I still do that today. Daddy served four years in the US Navy and was so proud when he told me his war stories. I listened to him when no one else wanted to hear them. I have two sisters who were a bit older than me, and they left home at an early age to get married. So I was like an only child for, for several years. So I was a little spoiled. <laughs> you be quiet. <laughs> he, he and my mom always wanted a boy. Well, I was their last chance. So after Daddy came home from the war, they tried that one last time. Well, guess what? I was a girl. They tried very hard to make me like a little boy. My Daddy put a bowl on my head to cut my hair. <laughs> my mom put long pants on me. And, you know, I had to do little boy things, you know, like and in our neighborhood, that was a good thing because most everybody were boys. We didn't have many girls there. So I climbed trees and did all that sort of thing. My daddy loved to tease me, and I was so gullible. I believed everything he told me. Uh, <laughs> he grew up in the mountains, so most of our vacation time was spent in the mountains. So on one of our trips, I was sitting in the back seat and I noticed these goats grazing up on the side of the mountain. So I said, Daddy, how do those goats stand up there on that steep mountain without falling off? He calmly said, well, Carol, they have two short legs and two long legs. So I started thinking about that and I thought, well, Daddy, how do they walk when they come down off of that mountain? And he just started laughing. So I knew I had been had again. He was teasing me one more time. And I have to say this, and I, I really, I'm really smarter than that now, because I'm 70 now, so I'm, I'm a lot smarter than I was. But I was six years old before I knew that chocolate milk didn't come out of brown cows. <laughs> <laughs> so, because we, we had cows, uh, <laughs> but I, we didn't have a brown one, so. As I got a little bit older, I wanted to do everything that my dad did. You know, I wanted to go with him everywhere. So I went fishing with him. And on one trip, 
I was going to be really smart, and I was going to bait my hook myself. So I've got the worm, and I'm trying to get it on the hook. Well, I missed and stuck the hook through my thumb, and he had to cut it out. Well, I knew right then that fishing was not for me. So then when I got a little bit older, we decided I'd go hunting with him. And I'm talking rabbits and squirrels. So first of all, he taught me how to shoot his shotgun. Well, it had a kick to it. So I'm trying to shoot the shotgun. Well, guess what? It kicked and knocked me down. So that, that was kind of that for me. The worst thing about hunting, though, was skinning the animals and cleaning them as when you got them. I watched very closely and thought to myself, could I do that? It was gross. And I said, it was awfully hard trying to be a boy. So we had a small farm, and I tried to do all that my dad did. And we had cows. So one evening, my dad said, Carol, come with me. We're going to go milk the cows. And boy, was I surprised. He showed me how to get milk out of the cow. So I tried my very best. I pulled and I pulled, but no milk came out. My dad was patient, and he said, push up and then pull down. So I tried that. So I did, and wow, milk came out. But as I was showing my daddy, I evidently turned, so the milk hit him in the face. <laughs> So he immediately said, Carol, go back to the house. You cannot milk cows. And I didn't let him know it, but I was glad, because that was a job I didn't want to do. The cows would often get out of their fence. So Daddy would say, Carol, come help me round up the cows. So here we go. I'd get out there, and I did pretty good until they started running towards me. When they came towards me, I turned around the other way. Daddy said, stop, you stand there, wait till they get to you. And I, I'm thinking, are you kidding? They look mean and they're big. So I think we decided at that point that I was not a farm girl. When I was in junior high, I started playing basketball. Now I really like that, and I was so proud when my dad came to watch me. We went to the football games together. Finally, I could do something a boy could do that I really liked. But my dad had decided I was a girl, and he was proud of me anyway. My mom and dad didn't go to church very much when I was growing up because they worked in mills, and they still kept the farm going, so they were working pretty much around the clock. But they made sure I went to Sunday school and church, as they did with my older sisters when they lived at home. Uh, they sent me to Vacation Bible School. As a matter of fact, I went to two every year, two different churches. So I learned all about Jesus and everything. Uh, when my father got cancer for the first time, he was 62 years old. That's when my family came in contact with Reverend Benny Smith. My dad was very proud and worked hard and was a good person. He resisted Benny's attempt to teach him about his eternal salvation, but Benny never gave up on him. A period of time went by before my dad finally listened. That particular night, my dad and my mom accepted Christ as their personal Savior. What a wonderful day. My mom and dad came to church for many years as my mom's health stopped her from coming, my dad kept coming by himself. He was something, there, this was something else we could share. So I started coming to this church and bringing my children here. And that was about 1974, I think. My dad had his ups and downs as all Christians do, but Benny was right there to help encourage him the last three years of my dad's life, I took him to the doctors and hospitals every time. Some days we would be down at Veterans Hospital all day till 7 p.m. at night. 
During all those times, I came to know him, not just as my father, but as my friend. He was my best friend. We shared so many memories, and he taught me so much that I did not know. I felt such admiration for my dad, and also for Benny, because he never gave up on him. My dad loved Benny and this church. He often said, I love that Benny Smith, but don't you tell him. <laughs> and when we would leave this church on Sunday morning, Benny, as he often does, he would kiss Daddy on the cheek. Well, Daddy being the macho man he was, he'd ball his fist up. He said, if it was anybody but you, I'd pop you one. <laughs> uh, after a period of time, my dad's sickness got worse. Uh, my dad told me on May the 27th, 1994, as I had taken him to Veterans Hospital once again because he was dehydrated, he said, Carol, I'm tired and I don't want to do this anymore. You need to let me go. I want to go home. Do you understand? I said, yes, if that's what you really want, I can let you go. I know you've tried to hang on for me. As the ambulance took him home that night, I followed behind them crying and praying. But at the same time, I had a peace because I knew his home was in heaven. He died the following day, May 28, 1994, at 5 p.m. I miss him so much, but I have the assurance that he is happy in his final home, and I know I will see him again. Thank you. Time for me to marry to a preacher. 